So I guess to start with, Ken, in, in this case, which came first, the filmmaker or the subject? What, what was the initial hook for you? Um, Christopher Nolan uh, contacted me and, and said he would, uh, he'd like to come and talk to me about a project. And uh, so he, he flew to London and saw a production of Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, which we were doing in the West End. And the next morning I met him and he was absolutely brilliant in his analysis of the play and the experience of the play. So it was, it was fascinating to hear that. I thought it, it, was, it really was, it was a great treat to have a, a kind of workshop on, on the sort of dramaturgy behind The Winter's Tale from a really passionate and, and, and intellectual outsider. But anyway, so that took up half the morning. And then the other half of the morning he said, look, I've, I've written this film called Dunkirk and uh, there's a part in it I'd like you to play. And he took me through what he intended and uh, but but the truth is uh, as it were he got me at hello um so it was the it was the filmmaker so who is commander bolton what's going on with him? uh commander bolton is a naval commander in this film in in charge of the um safe um evacuation of men from the mole the long um, breakwater that stretches into the uh, ocean at Dunkirk and we were able to film there and to try and recreate some of the challenges that were uh, mounting this operation in that particular part of it which was to get as many uh, of those 340,000 men off the beach as possible so he dealt with being um, bombed and, and with the uh, um, the difficulty of the tidal system, which meant big boats couldn't get in easily for half of the time, uh, and was constantly under pressure both both in, in t terms of actual enemy attack and stress and lack of sleep across the days of the operation. And he's based on a number of real individuals wh whom Chris Nolan had researched, um, and he becomes a sort of um, uh, a representative of what, what, what was happening uh, at sea. I now know from you that, that uh, Nolan is a great uh, dra drama critic, but the other thing I know, having heard him say many times in the last two days, is how he likes to shoot things for real. Yes. So you really were on the mole. Yes, and indeed. It, you're, you're not against green screen, and, and presumably that's got to add a flavour and a context. To it. Yes, I think that across any shooting day, you just have the real sense of how, particularly by, by the ocean, the, 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 the temperature, the the wind, the, the weather in general varies enormously and dramatically. Um, so suddenly you're in a rainstorm, suddenly the, there's bright sunshine, uh, ev everything makes a difference. Everything made all the variables in that rescue operation always um, challenging to, to deal with. So uh, you, you being there in the here, here and now, and uh, as Chris famously doesn't like to sit down, and nobody else does, and, and, and you get this energy, tremendous energy and, and natural quality around the set. For this picture, that's my one experience of working with Chris, which was, um, yeah, it continually kept you, as the film does, in the situation. One of the things the film shows very well is, is how young most of the, the, the people um, were involved. But of course, Bolton is, is an older character. How, what's Bolton's perspective on, on the whole event? You get the sense with characters that, like the Bolton or Mark Rylance's character, that these are people who've probably been through the previous uh, Great War, the War to End All Wars. And I think that they are, um, in a way, they represent um, a certain kind of um, paternal solidity, a certainty that that generation who know what it's like will either come for you or they will stay here and be by your side while they see what they have been through before and whilst they also understand having been through uh, warfare themselves the fragility of it and the necessity of helping and trying to get people home. So he, in a way, Bolton's job is, is, is simply to be there and be a beacon, be an example, be someone not panicking. Um, being a human example and a quiet, organized, logical um, uh, coordinator in the midst of all of that chaos. But of course, what's interesting is that he's also a human being and he also gets scared. And he also really feels this responsibility to this to this uh, group of 400,000, mainly English but also French um, soldiers. And uh, so he he becomes a, a sort of a, a barometer, if you like, for the, the what's going on outside. 
and we see a lot of that played off James Darcy representing the army. Is, is there a tension, an army-navy tension there, or are they all working together? I think both. They have to work together, and there is a tension. There is a certain sense that uh, their, their way is the best way, but one of the very fascinating things about a picture like this and that situation is uh, that the, the, the elements are so um, elemental. You, you, you have to deal with when, whether there's a nice moment between them when uh, an army man uh, is, is unable to understand quite uh, the nature of the tidal system, which is very helpful that the Navy man does understand, but at the same time uh, it's the army getting all those men to that point of embarkation, so they're forced to understand the other's perspective, and there's mutual respect, but there's also a, a sort of competitive thing that the situation sort of wears down, because in, in the end it's a very clear example of a necessity, however difficulty, uh, have a difficult of working together. If, if Nolan had you at Hello for, for you as an actor, what was it like for you as a director watching them? A privilege. Um, another actor, I, another director I admire enormously, uh, Danny Boyle, uh, once said to me that one thing he envied about my position was that I was able to watch other directors direct, um, which he, he, he can't get to do. And in this case, because in that case I could see him and work with Danny a couple of times. and. Uh, to watch Chris Nolan in action was it was a privilege to, but also to have met him, that initial contact to feel the passion behind it. The, he, he's a, such an interesting figure for his parallel capacity. And I think both things are meeting in his work. There's there's always been a sort of, at least to this outside observer, tremendous intellect, amazing sort of mathematical scientific brain. And with this project, it felt as though it was coming to a sort of to the other frontal lobe, as it were, and, and all the sort of passion and sort of wildness and, and, and pure feeling were being expressed. Something to get back to the initial conversation when we were talking about Shakespeare, he was talking in, in his own life about his, with his children getting older, the, the, the value of life, the fragility of life was very, the, the value of time uh, was really uh, key to him and he saw Dunkirk as a way in which that was all wrapped up. Time was, was so precious both to get them off the beaches and in those young lives to be saved. And, uh, and so to see him work that out w against our own, you know, very um, trivial by contrast set of challenging circumstances, big movie group, thousands of extras, the beach, the weather, everything changes, real ship traffic going on, to see him do all that with that laser clarity and vision uh, and uh, basically this marriage of head and heart which, which seemed to represent where he was going with this film. Uh, was really um, very, very impressive. And most impressive was that he seemed to have time for uh, everyone. Uh, without He didn't need to be Father Christmas, as it were, about it, but he just is able, rather like footballers, you know when they talk about footballers who can create, they, they sort of operate in a different time element, they slow things down, they, they, they make other people have to run around somehow. Chris could whilst the machine is, you know, relentlessly moving forward, questions being asked, what do we need, where's the camera? Somehow he could give that instruction and still talk to that actor, be it someone with no lines or someone with one line or somebody famous or somebody who lives in Dunkirk or wh whoever, whatever, that capacity to um, sort of poetically <laughs> multitask was very impressive. It struck me watching it, I was thinking back to well, you and Henry V, and there is something very British, and I, as Chris is on, on record as wanting to make this British story. Is there something sort of, patriotic's the wrong word, but Dunkirk is now deep in our psyche. Mm -hmm. Did you guys feel that and that responsibility? The name and what it, we associate with it, which is a some, some, some attitude that suggests that you need never give up, that somehow um, there is, there, there is a... a a larger sort of community, um, spirit, movement, whatever it is that can help, will help, will support, um, very modestly expressed, but with, with great beauty. I think uh, th that idea of the Dunkirk spirit has somehow been in our consciousness, at least in mine growing up. This film, I think, really roots it down into a sort of sensibility that is pro-human, pro-life, pro-peace, pro-no-fuss. You know, it's a very for a spectacular sort of all kind of effects blazing movie about something incredibly powerful, it is a very modest film. 
It has the modest center. It's about modesty. It's about a sort of graciousness that's ex that is exemplified in in you know the spirit of something somebody like Mark Rylance's character, or in the bravery of Finn Whitehead's, or, or in in the or, or in the you know the beautiful kind of doggedness of Tom Hardy's character, or uh, just there, there's something about their characters that are so human and and real and and um, unshowy that is at least an image of a certain kind of Britishness and Dunkirkness that um, uh, I think is particular to to um, a, a story like this and a picture like this. And it, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a quite extraordinary combination of a spectacle about something in the center which is very quiet and still. Yeah. And that's for us, of course, in, in the UK. Do you, do you think that will have a, a, a voice? Okay, speak to the rest of the world. Well, I think that we, we we need not own it as Brits in that sense because, again, a simple but kind of brave conceptual choice is not really to make much of, except in their elemental form, the difference between Army, Navy, Air Force, or indeed between English, French, Germans. The, 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 there's no whiff of... Of, there's no whiff of, of, a, of a jingoistic or pro-Brit kind of thing. It's, it's pro-humanity, I think, and he he takes the he takes those nationalistic possibilities away. Doesn't judge. There's no judgment in the film. I don't think there's no there's no finger wagging morality. There's no on one level there are no winners. At the same time, it is peopled with heroes, um, and uh, and I think that that's that's. Universal. It puts a group of uh, a group of men, in this case, into a terrifying situation, and invites through this visceral tre treatment the audience to go. This is what it's like. So you don't need to know where they're from. Nobody nobody seems to have a surname or a backstory or anything. You don't need to. It's only about being in this situation now, and your humanity now. Um, so anybody can connect with that. They don't have to have uh, the badge of a nation. Uh,